Hi, I'm Dr. Malescu. I'm here to do a review, uh, AMP1 lab uh, first practical for my Daytona State College students at the main campus. Um, we have a different handout that highlights um, pretty much everything in appendicular as well as uh, axial skeleton. There are a few things that are not mentioned, so I will highlight those as well to give you a holistic, comprehensive understanding of all the bony landmarks of the human skeleton. So <clears throat> I hope this helps your uh, studies uh, prior to your first practical. And uh, to all the students out there studying anatomy as well, if it's helpful, great, I've done my job. All right, so let's begin. The first one on the list is the clavicle. So the clavicle is an S-shaped uh, bone structure. And as you know, in layman terms, it's called the uh, collarbone. Um, the sternal end is uh, along the midline, so it's mid-sagittal. And we call this the acromial end. Now, why is it the acromial end? Because if you see Mr. Stanley here, <clears throat> the acromial end is going to articulate as you can see right here, let me bring this closer to you. It's going to articulate with the acromion of the scapula. So here's the scapula posteriorly. There's the spine. Follow the spine all the way around anteriorly, and you can see the acromioclavicular joint because the clavicle starts over here by the manubrium, okay? It curves out convex, it curves in concave, and it flares back out over here as you can see, and it articulates right here with the acromion, okay? So it starts here convex, concave, and it flares out and meets up with the uh, acromion of the uh, scapula. All right, so that's how you identify. You need to be able to identify left from right. You start off with looking at the sternal end versus the acromial end, okay? So it cannot be a left it can only uh, be a right and why is that because it's supposed to be convex concave and then flaring out anteriorly so it's convex concave as shaped sternal end acromial end last thing to identify to be able to know right from left is that the inferior end you can see that little bump right there if you don't let me flip it over so the inferior surface is now visible right here and you can see that tubercle all right so that's a tubercle on the clavicle so anterior portion okay and superior portion is smooth inferior portion is not it has a lot of ridges and that tubercle okay so that's the clavicle all right, so we move on from the clavicle and go on to the scapula. The scapula, you also need to know right from left. So how do you know? Well, the glenoid cavity articulates with the humerus. That always has to be lateral. All right, so let's take a look. Does this make any sense? No. This glenoid cavity has to be facing lateral. So yes, this makes sense because my arm, okay, is lateral. That's the mid-sagittal. So this is lateral. The spine always has to be posterior. So therefore, you can see this is a right scapula. Glenoid cavity, spine, and the end of the spine is called the acromion, which I just mentioned articulates very closely with the acromial end of the clavicle. Now, um, on your list, you have acromion process, spine of scapula, and glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity, that's gonna definitely be on the practical and you should be able to identify it. Now, um, what is not on this list, but I wanna make sure all the bony landmarks are mentioned so you're familiar with it and you're able to master the scapula bone. So, as I mentioned, this is the spine, acromion, coracoid, glenoid cavity, and then therefore, if the glenoid cavity is always lateral, this is the lateral surface, this is the medial surface, this is a fossa and this is a fossa. A fossa means surface. Above the spine is called supraspinous fossa. Below the spine is called infraspinous fossa. Turn it around and this is the subscapula fossa. Okay, so that's done. Put it aside. We did the clavicle, we did the scapula. Now uh, we move on to the humerus. So let's start with the humerus. Um, Basically, for the humerus, you're supposed to understand where the locations of the proximal end is and distal end. So obviously, that's pretty easy. The head is proximal, 
and there's the medial head is always facing medial articulating with the uh, glenoid cavity okay so it's always supposed to be articulating with the glenoid cavity all right the other thing that you have to identify uh, to be able to know left from right olecranon fossa that's a surface right there okay according to this uh, you definitely should know olecranon fossa uh, proximal distal end and head of the humerus. Now I'm going to go into more detail and I'll tell you why. I think you should understand a little bit more. Um, the head, as you can see, is medial. The olecranon fossa is medial. Now I'm going to show you a little trick here to identify with the ulna. is very important. The ulna and uh, humerus have a close relationship because you see it looks like a wrench. The top portion of the ulna is called the olecranon process which obviously is going to articulate with the olecranon fossa, like this. Like a lock and key, it's a notch. It goes right into this uh, process, goes into this fossa, okay? And it's a hinge joint articulating sagittal plane motion that makes up your elbow joint. So that's the olecranon fossa, okay? Now, a little minor details that I should mention. If you look at it anteriorly, you're going to see two tubercles right here one is superior and one is inferior this is only seen on the anterior view of the humerus if i turn it around you're not going to see it it's it's nothing there's nothing there it's smooth just the neck and the head okay so all you're going to see posteriorly is the olecranon fossa if you turn it anteriorly you're going to see a tubercle here and you can feel it and a tubercle here greater and lesser tubercle intertubercular group that's what that is greater and lesser tubercle intertubercular groove, okay? Now, there's other uh, structures down here that you should know about. This is the trochlea, and you'll see in Mr. Stanley here, if I bring him back over here, you can see that the trochlea hangs low. It's an overhanging structure, and it's still going to articulate with the ulna, okay? And so, therefore, the radius, the radius is the other forearm bone, is going to articulate with the structure laterally, which I'm going to mention in a second. It's called the capitulum. All right, so how do you memorize this? Well, it's pretty easy. This is the uh, medial aspect because the head is always medial, so medial epicondyle, and this is the trochlea. So, therefore, I came up with Mike and Tom hang out medially. All right, so Mike is medial epicondyle, trochlea. Laterally, you're going to see lateral epicondyle right here, and then this notch right there, see it? That's the capitulum, so C for Kathy. So Lucy and Kathy with a C. All right, so that's pretty much it with the humerus. I probably gave you more information that you need to know, but it's best to know more than less, so that's the humerus. Moving on to the radius. Uh, radius is pretty easy. We have a radial head that's flat. We have a radial tuberosity and we have a styloid process. That's pretty much it, okay? Uh, not much else to know. The radial tuberosity is right there. Okay, we move on. As I mentioned, the distal end uh, has the styloid process. Guess what? So does the ulna. Both have styloid processes. Styloid process, styloid process. One more thing I wanted to let you know is that the head of the radius, as I mentioned before, articulates with the capitulum. Um, let me just bring Stanley back just to highlight that. So there's the radial head, okay, point to it, radial head, and then capitulum, all right? So the radial head articulates with the capitulum. So this is the movement in the elbow, okay? The hinge joint, which is sagittal plane motion. All right, next, uh, we're going to finish up the ulna. So what about the ulna? The ulna, on your list, it has uh, olecranon process, dilate process, proximal and distal ends. All right. So olecranon process, I already mentioned. Then you can see right here uh, the C-shaped structure. Um, just remember that is what creates that hinge movement, uh, the elbow joint. And there's your styloid process. Okay. So radius, ulna, not a big deal. Moving on. Carpals. <clears throat> All right, so really, you just have to remember how many carpals there are, eight. Okay, so the carpals are located here. Uh, the metacarpals are five, and then you have the proximal and distal phalanx, no middle. So therefore, your thumb and your hallux 
uh, which is your big toe, only has a proximal and a distal phalanx, no middle. The ones that have a middle phalanx, so proximal, middle, distal, proximal, middle, distal, proximal, middle, distal, proximal, middle, distal. So toes two to five and fingers two to five. So digits two to five, both lower extremity and upper extremity have a proximal, middle, and distal phalanx. Pollux for the thumb, hallux for the big toe. They have a special name. Metatarsal in the toes, metacarpal, so the metacarpals in the hand, all right? So just note the difference. The hand and the foot have some similarities. The carpal bones versus the tarsal bones are quite different in shape. So um, I have a mnemonic for that as well, but I really don't need to go over it now because all that you're responsible for is to understand how many bones you have. Uh, but I'm gonna go over it anyway just so you have an idea. Thumb trapezium, adjacent to that, to the second metacarpal, inferior to that, trapezioid so trapezium trapezioid the middle finger capitate the ring finger uh fourth metacarpal you've got the hamate inferior to it then if you look here you could see this bone that sticks up right here and it's on top of another bone pisiform triquetrum and then if you look here it looks like a half moon that's lunate and then the last bone right here is called scaphoid okay so Trapezium, trapezioid, capitate, hamate, pisiform, triquetrum beneath it, lunate, scaphoid. That's it. Okay, finished with the hand. We move on to the hip. Let's do the hip. So, <coughs> excuse me, the hip, you have to identify left from right. So you know that the pubic bone is in the front. Your acetabulum, the hip socket, is always going to have to be lateral so therefore in looking at this this is a left hip because the pubic bones in the front and the acetabulum is lateral i can't do this doesn't make any sense but i can do this it makes sense you can see that the um, hip socket the acetabulum is facing laterally and the pubic bone is anterior now what do you need to know this is the ilium bone now if you cut this obturator foramen, which is this big hole here, if you cut it in half, in front of uh, this uh, paintbrush, okay, anterior to it is the pubic bone. Posterior to my paintbrush right here is the ischium, okay? And this bump right here is what you sit on. That's called the ischial tuberosity. All right, so you have to know the ilium, the ischium, and the pubic bone, as well as the acetabulum, all right? So let's do that one more time. Ilium, ischium, pubic bone, uh, ischial tuberosity. Acetabulum is right in here. Um, that's filled with cartilage. Now, let's go over bony landmarks. Um, your handout says anterior superior spine. It's actually anterior superior iliac because it's on the ilium, okay? And you're going to see it in the medical world as ASIS, okay? We do a lot of um, bone graft samples from the ASIS section because there's a lot of red marrow there. All right, so this anterior superior iliac spine, anterior inferior iliac spine, all based on location. This is anterior and it's superior. This is anterior and it's inferior, and you see the bump. Okay, see it sticks out and see it sticks out. So anterior superior iliac spine, anterior inferior iliac spine. Iliac crest, because it looks like a, a rooster's crest. Posterior superior iliac spine, posterior inferior iliac spine. This is a notch, we call it the greater sciatic notch. This is a spine, it sticks out. Iliac spine, this is a lesser sciatic notch. This is what we sit on, the ischial tuberosity. This is a hole, it's called the obturator foramen. This is your pubic bone and there's a pubic tubercle which is quite prominent there. And that's pretty much everything on the hip. Your list, your handout doesn't have all that. It definitely has the iliac crest, you need to know that. Anterior superior iliac spine, anterior inferior iliac spine, posterior superior, posterior inferior. Although it only shows you the superior ones, make sure you know the, the varieties. There's a superior and an inferior. The uh, locations, it's all based on location and the name of the bone. The ischium has the ischial tuberosity, which is rather large. This is pretty much what you sit on. The muscles go over it. Okay? 
And the pubic symphysis. So what is the pubic symphysis? Let me point it out to you because this is important. You can see it right here. I turned it vertically. So it is a fibrocartilage that's located in between the two hip bones, okay? So the fibrocartilage, where else do you see it? You only see it in the intervertebral discs and as well as the knee, the menisci, medial meniscus, lateral meniscus, all right? So we're done with the hip. Moving on, we go to the femur. Let's do the femur. Here is the femur. So you need to know, again, left from right. So as we mentioned, just with the humerus and the scapula, the glenoid cavity of the scapula was always lateral and the head of the humerus was always facing medial. Well, same thing here. The design is exactly the same. This is a left hip and I purposely found a left femur and you can see this is the movement now unlike the hinge joint of an elbow you've got circumduction you've got motion in three directions frontal sagittal and transverse so you can rotate your hip just like you can rotate your shoulder so you've got triplanar motion that's what that's called just like this okay so in doing hip replacements we want to make sure we can achieve that all right so going to the anatomy of this uh, femur, let's go over it. This is the head. There it is. That's the neck. That's pretty easy. Now let's turn it around posteriorly. Do you see a difference? There are these big bumps here. Anteriorly, you don't see it. All you see anterior is the patella surface. And let me just show you where the patella surface is in reference to the skeleton. Let me bring him back. And you can see Mr. Stanley here. I'm going to lift his knee up. And you can see the uh, condyles. And uh, pretty much the uh, patella is gonna sit on top. It looks like he lost his patella on this right side. Oh well, he's been playing soccer, I take it. <laughs> All right, so there it is. You can see the patella, which is your kneecap, and it's right on top, distally, over the patella surface of the femur. All right, so let me move Stanley back. Oh, I just dislocated his hip. Good, it's back in place. All right. So patella surface is anterior, all right? Now let's go posterior because there's a lot more. Here are the condyles. The condyles articulate with the tibia, okay? Like this, see? All right, so guess what? The knee is a hinge joint just like the elbow. So uh, there you have it. You have the patella surface right here, and then look posteriorly, you have the condyles. Now how do you reference the condyles? Again, based on location. The head is always medial, right? So therefore, this is the medial condyle right there. So if this is the medial condyle, this is the lateral condyle. Now look over here, you have the epicondyle is on top. Epicondyle is on top. So because this is medial, look at the head. This is medial epicondyle, medial condyle. Lateral epicondyle, lateral condyle, okay? In between is the intercondylar surface. Well, for your test on your handout, what do you have? You have the head and neck of the femur, so we did that. Greater and lesser trochanter, that's the next thing. See, right here and here. Only seen posterior view. Anterior view, what you see is the patella surface. So there you have it. Big bumps right here. One here, one here. Now, where else did you see that? You saw that in the humerus, right? The humerus had the greater tubercle and lesser tubercle. Well, here you have the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter. And yes, there's an intertrochanteric line. Okay, no sulcus, just a line. But all you need to remember is greater trochanter, lesser trochanter. Yes, you need to know medial condyle and lateral condyle. And as usual, just like the humerus, you had the epi, right? Epi means on top. So the medial epicondyle, lateral epicondyle. Medial condyle, lateral condyle. Okay, so that's pretty much it for the femur. Head, neck, a femur, greater, lesser, trochanter, medial, lateral condyle, proximal, distal end. Okay, we move away from the femur and we move down to the tibia. All right, so voila, this is the tibia. One last thing I want to show you. I think I showed it to you before. Look at the articulation between the tibia and the femur. Okay, so the tibia has these condyles as well, see? And then you have these little two bumps here, intercondylar eminence. Not on your list, but I did want to point it out because that's an important joint. A lot of knee replacements, right? 
So always remember, this is not a styloid process. May look like one, but it's not pointy enough, so we call it the medial malleolus. Why? The tibia, tibia absolutely always 100% must be medial to the fibula, okay? So if we have a fibula right here, and we have a tibia hanging out, it looks like this, okay? So we've got, we've got the um, lateral malleolus on the fibula, and then we've got the medial malleolus on the tibia, and then we've got a foot. Let's do this. Unfortunately, I've got the wrong foot. I've got a right foot instead of a left. Okay, but you get the picture, the talus, okay? So I needed a left foot, so pretend this is a foot. All right, so the talus on the foot articulates with the tibia, okay? All right, so let's go over the tibia. So what you need to know for your practical is to make sure that you're able to identify this bump right here. That is called the tibial tuberosity and, of course, the medial malleolus. And that's pretty much it. Proximal versus distal end, you know that the proximal end has the condyles. All right. The fibula, easy peasy, not a big deal. All you have is a head and a malleolus. So how can you tell the difference? Well, the head is kind of an oblique flat surface. And then look at the distal end. It has this pointy structure called the lateral malleolus, okay? It's long, it's slightly bowed, and the lateral malleolus faces laterally, kind of overhanging over that uh, talus. So let me uh, bring Mr. Stanley's foot up and you'll see what I mean. Here we go. All right. So as you can see here, his uh, tibia is uh, hanging medially. That's the medial malleolus. This is his left foot. You got dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. There's the talus. And then hanging laterally here, floating fibula, it over, it's over that talus and calcaneus, which is the heel bone. So lots of uh, ankle injuries occur here because there's ligaments that attach anterior talofibular ligament, meaning it attaches from the talus to the fibula. And those are the typical grade one sprains where you tear, partially tear, or rupture the anterior talofibular ligament. Just, you know, a little trivia. You don't need to know for the exam, but uh, you need to kind of understand why you need to learn this because in the future, you'll, you'll need to identify all these bones uh, to understand the, the injuries out in the medical field. All right, so moving away from fibula, we did tibia, fibula, uh, patella, there's not much to say about. It's a real tiny bone. It's right here. You can see it. Um, if we put it on the table, you should be able to identify it. Not very stressful. Uh, there's really not much uh, in terms of bony landmarks to memorize. Okay, let's go on to the foot, my forte as a podiatrist. So obviously I'm gonna go over it in detail, even though you probably don't need it, but I'm gonna give it to you anyway, how about that? Um, according to what you uh, need to take home in terms of um, mental notes uh, prior to taking this test, is that there are five metatarsals. Well, that's easy. Um, there are 14 phalanges in each foot, and we have um, the tarsal bones, which I'm gonna go over now. All right, so here we go. So you have the rear foot consists of the talus right here, and it articulates with the tibia. So let me get a tibia. So it articulates with the tibia, okay? Tibia is gonna be articulating. The only problem is I have the wrong foot. This is a right foot and this is a left tibia, all right? But this articulates, the top of the talus articulates with the tibia. So that's the tibial tailor joint, that's your ankle joint. Okay, so you learn that the bone on top in the rear foot is called the talus. This one's called the calcaneus. Check out the foot, okay? Now, medially, you have uh, this bone right here, it's called the navicula. If I flip the foot over, you could see it kind of looks like a boat, the shape of a boat. Well, a boat navigates, so I call this, we call this the navicular, okay? So this structure right here, this bone, is called the navicular. All right, so what does it articulate with? It articulates with the tailor head right there. So there's the talus, tailor head, navicular. Okay, well, take a look at this bone right here. It kind of looks like a cube, so guess what we call it? Cuboid. Okay, so cuboid, calcaneus, so calcaneal cuboid joint. All right, now, the last thing you, you can see here, there are three bones, and they all have the same name, cuneiforms. There's a medial cuneiform, an intermediate cuneiform, a lateral cuneiform, there's your cuboid, 
talus calcaneus. That's all the bones called the tarsal bones, okay? Rear foot is talus and calcaneus. Midfoot is going to be navicular right here. Medial, intermediate, lateral cuneiform, and cuboid, okay? There's 26 bones in the foot in total. Metatarsal 1, metatarsal 2, metatarsal 3, metatarsal 4, metatarsal 5. The big toe has a proximal and distal phalanx. And as I said with the hands, toes 2, 3, 4, and 5 have a proximal middle distal phalanx. All right. That's it with the phalanx. And with the foot, say bye-bye. Now we move on. Whew, it's a lot, right? Now we move on to uh, axial skeleton. Uh, which we did today, uh, we're going to finish up skull, um, all the vertebrae, the ribs, the rib cage, and all that. So let's start. First things first, we look at the skull. The main thing is to know the bones on the skull. So right here is the anterior portion of the skull. That's the frontal bone. Right here is the parietal. Cutting across is a suture called the sagittal suture. Cutting across like a crown is the coronal suture. Coronal suture, sagittal suture. Behind you over here, this whole back region is called the occipital bone. The suture right here cutting across between the parietal and occipital is called the lambdoid suture. Then this bone right here is the temporal bone and you've got a suture above that. That would be called the squamous suture. All right, now, um, in terms of temporal bone, we need to identify external acoustic meatus, also known as external auditory meatus. We also have to identify the styloid process and the mastoid process. All right, here we go. First things first, external acoustic meatus, basically it's your ear hole right there. Now, if we flip the skull over, you can see two bony prominences. The, the one that's more broad and it's right inferior to the external acoustic meatus, right here. It's directly inferior. There's the external acoustic meatus, and right below that is the mastoid process. Now watch this. If I flip it over, you can see adjacent to it, medial and anterior, right there, is the styloid process. So mastoid process, styloid process, okay? That's all located on the <clears throat> temporal bone. Okay, now occipital bone, as I mentioned before, has the lambdoid suture. According to your handout, you should be able to identify the foramen magnum, which uh, the spinal cord runs through it right in here. So right there. And then adjacent to that right here, you can see the occipital condyles in which the first cervical articulates with it. So this is the first cervical, the atlas. You can see the condyles right here, let me put this skull down. These condyles right here, these are the facets for the occipital condyles on the skull. All right, so this is C1. All right, so it, you can imagine a four pound brain and the skull is held together by this little tiny bone called C1. So that's where all the injuries take place in your neck. All right, so we did that. Let's see what else is there. All right, let's go over the sphenoid bone because we did frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital, sphenoid bone. Sphenoid bone, you can see it in multiple areas. First off, you can see it right here in the orbit superiorly. And remember, I taught you this morning that you have additional bones in the orbit and know their existence. You've got the lacrimal behind it. You've got the ethmoid superiorly. You've got the sphenoid bone, which we're going over now. Laterally around that orbit is the zygomatic, right? And then inferiorly is the maxilla or max. All right, if you remember my mnemonic, it was Lucy, Ethel, Sam, Zach, and Max, okay? So anyway, why am I mentioning it? Because right here up top is the sphenoid bone. You could also see the sphenoid right there. And then what we're really going over, highlighting, is the fact that you see a little bat inside interior skull. It looks like bat wings, the body of a bat. So the greater uh, wing right there, and then the lesser wing is right here. So look at the bat, you can see the wings. So greater wing in the sphenoid and lesser wing. Now, watch this. If you look back at the orbit again, you see uh, a fissure, greater orbital and lesser orbital fissure. But then right there, there's a circular hole. 
and it's called, it's there for the optic nerve. So guess what? It's called the optic canal. Now your handout will have optic foramen, it's the same thing. And so you can see it go through there and watch. If I stick the um, structure, you can see that it's right there. It's literally the ears of the bat. Okay, that's your optic canal. Um, so this paintbrush literally started out at the optic canal through your orbit, and then look where it comes out. All right, there's the bat, and you can see the bat ears. So you gotta use your imagination a little bit, but that is the optic canal. All right, and then, um, like I said, don't get confused. Optic foramen is another one. All right, so what else do you need to know? The uh, body of the um, bat right here. You can see the body of the bat. That's cella tersica. Um, also, another name for it is hypophysial fossa. Okay, so make sure you know that. All right. Now we move on to the ethmoid bone, which can be seen right here. Now, I don't know, I'm gonna go as close as possible to the video right here, to the screen. That ridge right there, that's crystagalli. The base has little tiny holes for the olfactory nerve, that's called the cribiform plate. Okay, um, and that's pretty much it for the skull. Um, there's a little bit more detail uh, regarding the mandible so let's go over that on your handout you have the mandibular condyle which is right here posterior and this is called a coronoid don't get these confused the one that you absolutely must know is um, the mandibular condyle all right um, there is also a mandibular foramen and you can see that back here uh, posteriorly and interiorly and then there's also a mental foramen so the mental foramen can be seen right there okay mental foramen so there's two holes in the uh, mandible okay moving on the maxilla well that's easy hold your top teeth so let's take a look that's the maxilla bone the bottom right here inferior portion is the vomer make sure you know that um, the septum, the nasal septum, is the perpendicular plate right there. You can see it. And then as it slopes down and forward, that's called the vomer. It's like a ski slope. All right, so that's called the vomer. And then up top is perpendicular plate. And then the shelving units there you can see are concha or concha, however you want to pronounce it. There's a superior middle and inferior concha. All right, now if you look at the... Um, interior portion inferior portion not interior we did interior already that was the back the interior portion you can see the roof of the mouth which is seen right in here take a look that's the palatine bone okay that's the hard palate okay so that's also something that you should take a look at um, the zygomatic arch okay you can see it right here the zygomatic bone the zygomatic arch all right, so this portion is attaching to the zygomatic bone, so we call it the zygomatic process of the temporal bone, but then this portion is attaching to the zygomatic bone, so we call it the um, temporal process of the zygomatic bone. You don't need to know all that detail. Just know it's a zygomatic arch, okay? All right, uh, what else? Lacrimal, I mentioned before, just don't forget, it's right here. It's right near your uh, lacrimal um, uh, tear ducts, okay? Uh, Vomer, I mentioned. Now let's go over the hyoid. Some of you have not seen what the hyoid looks like, but there it is. It looks like fangs, like vampire fangs or devil ears, whatever. But that is your hyoid bone. Um, you can see it on Mr. Stanley over here. Um, take a look at the hyoid bone right there. Okay. All right, in addition, we're now gonna move on from the skull, we're finished with the skull, and move on to the um, vertebrae. So the first vertebrae I wanna go over, which I seem to have lost, is the uh, atlas. Oh, never mind. here it is. Okay, so the atlas, you're supposed to be able to identify the atlas. It's C1, cervical one. It looks like, uh, to me, like the jaws of a shark, okay? And what's interesting, it has very wide wings 
wingspan, transverse foramina are right in here. Okay, and then the vertebral foramina right in here. So the transverse foramina are for the spinal nerves, the vertebral foramina is for the spinal cord, and then these are the facets for the occipital condyle, okay? Um, obviously, there's no spine. You could see there's no spine. So that's what's special. You need to be able to identify C1 for sure. Now check out C2. C2 is also special. Um, you see the spine. You see the spine has two fishtail. It has a fishtail appearance, see? It's bipedal. So it has a spine, so that's C2. What else does it have? This structure that sticks up, it's called the dens, and the dens is helping you turn your head. All right, so you put the two together like this, and voila, and so um, your, your neck is able to turn based on this axis, that's why we call it the axis is C2, and you see a spine, okay? Um, you don't really see much of a transverse process. It's quite tiny, as you can see. That's a small transverse process. But when you go to uh, the thoracic, uh, a very, very different story. Um, you can see that it's got a long spine and it looks like a giraffe. So that um, would be here, right here. This is a better one. That is the thoracic, okay? Truly looks like a giraffe, all right? And look at the wide transverse processes and the long um, spine. Okay, this long spinous process, and then the body is not as thick. Okay, so the next thing I want to show you is the uh, lumbar vertebrae. So take a look at the lumbar. It looks like a moose, and you can see the very wide transverse process and a very thick body to hold up the upper body. That's the lumbar. Always remember the numbers. You have C1 to C7. Um, you have T1 to T12 for thoracic and L1 to L5, okay? Um, what else? After this, I'm really just going to show you uh, the fact that you have a sacrum. There's not much to know about the sacrum. You can see the sacrum right here. It's fused uh, four to five bones and the sacral foramina, okay? And then we have a tailbone, three to four, very variable. What never varies and you should know is that you have... C1 to C7, that's never variable. It's basically concave. Convex is T1 to T12, and then concave is L1 to L5, okay? So that's pretty much the vertebrae. The last thing I wanna go over are the ribs and uh, the sternum. Okay, so not much to know here. Uh, it's pretty easy compared to the other bones. So you have the, uh, man the uh, manubrium right here. There's a suture that separates the manubrium from the body. Do you see the suture right there? So this section right here is the manubrium, the body, and then the distal end is called the xiphoid process. Okay, this notch is called the jugular notch, also known as suprasternal notch. Okay, that's pretty much everything you need to know about the sternum. And then finally, we have seven pairs of true ribs, five pairs of false ribs, and two floaters. And um, not much to know, but I am going to teach you how to identify a left from a right. So the pointy, uh, the sharp end is always going to be inferior. The sternal end is going to have a flat surface, kind of like what the clavicle was all about. The posterior surface has a tubercle, so therefore, you're going to recognize the sternal end is anterior and the posterior end has a tubercle inferiorly because it articulates, as you can see here, the tubercle of the ribs articulate with the transverse processes of the thoracic vertebrae. The ribs only articulate with the thoracic vertebrae, okay? So all I wanted to mention is left from right the sharp end is inferior, the dull end, the dull end is superior, so that's how you can tell. The sternal end is flat, the posterior end has a tubercle and articulates with the thoracic vertebrae. And guess what? We did the whole list. All right, I hope this video was helpful and please uh, feel free to email me, contact me anytime if you have any further questions. Good luck studying, may the force be with you.